Hello, and welcome to the webcast entitled, Our New Reality and a Culture of Change, a report on early experiences with CT dose assessment and protocol optimization. We have just a few announcements before we begin. The slides will advance automatically throughout the presentation. You may submit a question at any time by typing your question into the Q&A box located on your webcast interface under the slides window. If you experience technical difficulty, you may click on the Help icon on the bottom of your browser or contact the technical support number listed at the top of your browser. If your screen freezes or the slides do not appear to be advancing as they should, please try exiting and restarting the session as it may be an issue with your connectivity. I will now turn the call over to John Doherty, Marketing Manager for Dose Management for GE Healthcare. Please go ahead, Mr. Doherty. Thank you, Christine. Well, good afternoon and good morning to everyone on the call. I'm very excited to be here with Dr. Laurent uh, to, I think, you know, to talk about a topic that's very, very timely about how you create a dose management program within a hospital environment. So uh, we're very excited to be partnered with Advocate Lutheran Hospital and Advocate Lutheran General Hospital and just to really help support them on some of the great work that they've been doing. Uh, so with that, I'll start to turn this over to Dr. Arendt. Just a few housekeeping rules. I'll be helping out here to try to answer some questions throughout the call. If we don't have a chance to answer all the questions, we will be trying to follow up with you after the event and answer your questions as we go from there. Um, one specific thing is I do want to you know, note and, and do the proper disclaimers here. We are compensating Dr. Laurent for her time to present this material today, um, and with that, uh, I will turn it over to Dr. Lisa Laurent. She is the CT Medical Director and First Vice President of the Medical Staff for Advocate Lutheran General Hospital, and she's also the Chair of the CT Medical Directors for Advocate Healthcare, which is a 12-site IDN located here in the Chicagoland area. So we're very excited to have her share her thoughts about dose management, and I think some of the big things you'll take away from this topic is how important this can be from a, a hospital standpoint, how it can impact the organizational behavior, the real focus on quality and outcomes. Uh, so we're very excited with the results they've seen, and with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Laurent. Thanks, John. Good afternoon and good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedules to join me in the conversation about CT dose assessment and protocol optimization. I'm just thrilled to share our early experiences with you, and hopefully this will serve as a template or a formula for your own success where you are at your institution. So my talk today is is divided up into several uh, components. First of all, why dose watch? Um, then a little bit about the dose assessment and protocol optimization process, uh, how and why we created a dose management quality improvement project, our early results, the recognition that we've gotten so far from the American College of Radiology, and a few words about the 2014 Joint Commission Standards. And at this point, I'd just like you to know that Advocate Healthcare is accredited by Det Norske Veritas Healthcare Inc., or DNV, which is the largest ICO registrar in the United States and the third largest in the world, basically integrating ISO 9001 and Medicare conditions of participation compliance, including ISO 9001 quality management system. It focuses on sequence and interactions of processes throughout the institution. And then I'll be providing some final thoughts and summary. So why dose watch? I think many of you, if not all of you, will remember the horror that was the year 2010 when details became uh, apparent about what had occurred between February 2008 and August 2009 when over 400 patients across the country were inadvertently exposed to ultra-high doses of radiation from CT brain perfusion scans. Um, eight hospitals uh, in total were involved. Six were in the state of California. One was in Florida. One was in Alabama. Um, the range of overdose uh, was anywhere between 8 to 10 times the dose to 13 times the dose, which occurred in 65 patients in the state of Alabama. This also prompted questions as to why it took so long for luminary institutions to learn about uh, this sentinel event. Uh, patients were experiencing patches of hair loss, skin reddening, headache, memory loss, confusion. Uh, many are still at risk for brain damage and cancer. And, and one isolated event in California occurred when a two-and-a-half-year-old toddler fell out of bed, was presented to the emergency department, went to have a CT scan, and dad, after one hour, realized that the scan still was not finished, and it turns out 
that the CT scan had activated 151 times in the same area. So questions started to bubble to the surface among our executives and I'm sure among the executives at your institution as well. Could this happen where you are? And the answer simply is, yeah, it, it could. So what we did here at Advocate Healthcare was to ferociously, uh, proactively address this issue. We realized that it was very important to obtain a robust management tool that could measure, track, and optimize patient radiation dose over time, and that tool is GE Dose Watch. And in September 2012, the press conference that announced the collaboration occurred at my hospital, Advocate Lutheran General Hospital, and both entities committed to reducing radiation dose across the enterprise, and we decided to begin with CT. Now, just a little bit about Advocate Healthcare. As John said, it is an integrated delivery network. It's the largest in the metropolitan Chicago area and the state of Illinois. There are more than 250 sites of care, including 12 hospitals, which does include a critical access hospital, and one children's hospital, which has both a north campus and a south campus vis-a-vis -vis Chicago. There are 3,000 beds. There are five level one trauma centers, two level two trauma centers. There are five hospitals with magnet status and four teaching hospitals. My hospital, Advocate Lutheran General Hospital, is a level one trauma center, tertiary medical center with 638 beds. We also are the North Campus Children's Hospital. Across the entire enterprise, there are 47 CT scanners, and for the year 2013, between 250 and 285,000 CT scans were performed. Part of the commitment to keeping our patients safer was to submit our data to the American College of Radiology Dose Index Registry to measure our results against national benchmarks. Two hospitals were identified in Advocate to begin the dose watch process, and as of today, our institution, Advocate Lutheran General Hospital, has the, has the earliest results with the understanding that the template that we've created will then be disseminated throughout the enterprise so that other CG departments throughout Advocate will experience the, uh, the same opportunities. So let's talk a little bit about dose assessment and optimization. Um, I'm happy to report that our hospital is the first in the United States and Puerto Rico to undergo dose assessment and optimization, which we'll refer to as DAO throughout the discussion, utilizing specifically the Dose Watch analytics tool. The dose assessment and optimization activity is a three-pronged or multifaceted uh, activity. It is first and foremost a review of CT studies or protocols. There should also be a very robust and comprehensive technologist dose knowledge assessment curriculum established, and an interactive protocol optimization activity should occur. So these are the three components of the DAO that we experienced during the week of April 14th of this year, and then we ended up having a follow-up optimization activity the week of May 5th. The, the next few slides are basically illustrative of the depth and breadth of uh, data mining that can occur with this analytics tool and how easy you can generate objective data about what you're doing so you're no longer basing your decisions on anecdotal or observational or surrogate data. You're actually basing them on concrete data. So we found at our institution between January 1st and March 27th of the year 2014, we performed 7,464 CTs. Over 48% of them were done on our ER 750 CT scanner. Over 21% were done on our GE Lightspeed 16 in the main department. Each of the outpatient CT scanners generated a little over 12% of the CT studies, and the Brilliant 64 back at the main hospital generated a little over 6%, and that CT scanner is what we use for our cardiac imaging and interventional procedures. We're also able to divide pediatric versus adult activity, and this is uh, germane for those of you who have a significant pediatric uh, population as we do. We do have a bona fide children's hospital, so identifying the peds patients from the adult patients is very important. Activity analysis. Again, many of us, particularly the radiologists and technologists in the audience, have a strong intu intuitive appreciation of how many scans are done 
per patient, let's say, over a given period of time. What this tool provides you, however, is an exact breakdown of how many protocols per patient are being performed over a predetermined period of time. So for us, between January and March, 2,417 patients each received one protocol. Now, we're a level one trauma center, so we have a lot of combo protocols, and I'm sure many of you do as well. The head C-spine combo, the abdomen pelvis combo, the chest abdomen and pelvis combo, the CT angio head and neck with perfusion combo, et cetera. So this is the number of protocols per patient. 367 patients received two of those protocols, et cetera. We were able to determine that one patient actually received seven protocols during that time period, and you can see that that really translates into more exams, starting with the CT angio of the head and neck with perfusion done on February 16th, and then the subsequent head CTs after that. This is very valuable information for you to have at your fingertips when you're making decisions. But more importantly, this kind of information should begin to prompt questions about the appropriateness criteria used, let's say, in ordering repetitive head CTs. Now, this probably is a trauma patient or someone who experienced a catastrophic intracranial event. So, in all likelihood, each of those head CTs is completely appropriate. But the other question is, if the clinical team has an inkling that repetitive CT scans are part of the patient's care, should we then optimize the protocol to administer a lower dose? if we understand exactly what the disease entity is that we're following. So those are just some of the questions you should begin to raise when you see objective data like this. Knowing that the lion's share of our CT uh, comes from the ER scanner, we decided to do a deep dive, detailed analysis on that information. And we learned that uh, relative to the local description or body part, over 43% of CTs refer to the brain. 33.6% refer to the abdomen and pelvis, 8.6% are PE studies, et cetera. Now, the next slide is very important in terms of assessing the value, <clears throat> if you will, of what these uh, dose measurements are telling us. So what we did, we took the most common protocols from the ERCT scanner, and they're listed on the left-hand side. And then we determined what the median CTD eyeball was, the P75 CTD eyeball, and we compared them to the diagnostic reference levels. Okay? Now, just as a refresher for those of you uh, in terms of the terminology. The dose reference level is based on standard phantom or patient measurements under specific conditions. So the DRLs have been set at approximately the 75th of measured patient or phantom data. So this means that the, uh, the, the, the data surveyed have exposure levels at or below the 70th percentile when you see the phrase P75 CTDI vol. Now, the dose reference levels in pink, okay, 75 for the head, 21 for the chest, 25 for the abdomen and pelvis, they are compiled by the American College of Radiology and the American Association of Physicists in Medicine. And you can actually find this information on page five of the practice guidelines on the ACR website and the, and the references to that. Just so you know, the DRL 21, is for just a CT of the chest. It does not specifically pertain to CT angiography of the chest, okay? So in addition to that, you uh, also understand that the CT DI vol relates to the administered dose coming out of the machine for any single axial slice, and that the DLT is the cumulative or the total of that across the Z axis for any given series. Now remember, this is not effective dose, and the way that the AAPM addressed that issue was to come up with the site-specific, uh, the SSDE or the size-specific uh, dose estimate, uh, correct. And that basically is a formula that takes this information and helps calculate it based on the patient body habitus primarily weight and size. But we're not going to get into SSDE. That can be done offline uh, with another analytics tool. So the 
the yellow means that we were definitely within range. We were below the DRL. The pink means that we were above the DRL. If you look at the last two protocols, 26 and 27, for the P75 CTDIL, that was just a skosh over. The, the, the data that caught our attention was for the chest PE, the median CTDI ball of 58 and the P75 CTDI ball of 67. And we looked at that, and it took our breath away. But what was so eye-opening about the use of this analytics tool real-time at the CT scanner is that we were able to untangle the technique that we use for the timing bullets and the technique that we use for actually imaging the chest. And we realized that we used the identical technique for the timing bullets. We were killing a mosquito with a sledgehammer, in other words. And when we realized that, we saw that actually the median CTDI ball and the P75 CTDI ball for the actual imaging of the lungs was below the DRL. So what did this tell us to do? This told us to go back to the drawing board and retool the technique for the timing bolus and make it ultra, ultra low dose. We do not need a magnificent visual experience for the timing bolus. It's just a geographic or anatomic site. We don't need high contrast resolution. So that's where we are with this. So this was extremely powerful because the team was actually there when the application specialist proved this to us with black and white data. And nothing is more convincing or powerful than seeing this kind of informatics platform work real time at your institution with your own patients. The other benefit of having this kind of analytics tool is being able to generate a scatter plot. And what we could see from the data for routine abdomen and pelvis protocol during the same time period and during the 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. technologist shift is that the majority of the exams fell at or below the DRL. A few were above the DRL. So this also prompted us to think a little bit more intently about what this is messaging. First of all, why is there such a variance among those values that do fall below the DRL? Okay, why are the values falling above the DRL? Okay, and those are some of the issues that are going to be raised when we move forward with our dose management quality improvement project. The other thing that we were able to do is actually identify how accurate or on target we are when we actually perform a scan relative to the 11 factors that contribute to dose. And they're listed 1 through 11 on the left-hand side of your screen. So what we did was we cross-referenced the most common protocols from our dose watch data from the most common protocols that the technologists anecdotally uh, knew were being performed on the scanners. And interestingly enough, I'm told that there was a very tight correlation between what the text said were the most common CT protocols performed and what the dose watch data told us. And so we took 20 of them, and I'm just displaying a few of them here for purposes of this demonstration, and I want to draw your attention to the protocol 6.2 labeled as non-contrast abdomen and pelvis stone protocol. It's forced from the right side of your screen. Now, the green dots mean that we follow the protocol perfectly relative to the factors on the left. The yellow dot means that we follow the protocol vis-a-vis -vis that particular factor. Maybe we could have done it just a skosh better. Red means that we did not really do it appropriately. And what this particular exam tells us is that it is the positioning. It is the positioning of the patient that had an effect on the dose such that it put us in to that hazard warning area. We didn't go over the DRL, but we came close. And again, this is a very important and meaningful lesson that we continually uh, iterate amongst the staff at how important those cross-hatch marks are when we position the patient on the CT scanner. So we were able to see this real time, and again, the light bulbs were going off left and right, and everybody was just seeing the magnificence of this kind of analytics tool. Concurrent to while this was going on, a comprehensive education curriculum was being established for our technologists. 
and five randomly selected CT technologists volunteered to take a 59-question self-assessment survey having to do with the 11 factors that relate to dose, as well as a whole menu of issues related to radiation, patient positioning, knowledge, perfusion, et cetera, et cetera. And what we were able to do is analyze their own self-assessment information against uh, our own particular knowledge as, as a radiologist and the application specialist to come up with a series of strengths and opportunities. And these are just the general categories of our own strengths and opportunities. And I'm sure if you undergo this same kind of exercise at your institution, you'll come up with your own set of strengths and opportunities, education gaps, if you will, for, for all members on the workforce. In addition to that, we were able to actually plot via a color-coded bar graph the results of the self-assessment from the perspective of the technologists and the absolute uh, correct answer, if you will, as gauged by the application specialist who engaged in a very warm and supportive dialogue with the technologist. So this was a very positive exercise. We received a lot of positive feedback from the technologists who were so gracious enough to, to undergo this activity. They learned a lot and it was not punitive. There was no finger pointing. They really learned a lot. They thought it was an excellent experience. Uh, and I just would like to make a shout out now to our own team. Um, they are completely engaged in this. They're an excellent group of CT technologists, and they're very much concerned and dedicated um, to learning more. And again, from this particular exercise, we were able to come up with another set of strengths and opportunities, which we are now going to incorporate into the more comprehensive curriculum that we're in the throes of developing, which I'll discuss later on in the presentation. For two solid days, our CT uh, coordinator, uh, an outstanding individual, Kathy Zuniga, and I sat down with Lori Hall from GE, our excellent application specialist, and we did a deep dive on the protocols from the CT, uh, from the ER, the 750 uh, high def, and the light speed 16. And we targeted first the five most commonly ordered protocols the uh, chest PECT, the routine abdomen and pelvis, the head, the C-spine, the urogram, and the PEDS routine chest. And we, through a combination of permutations and combinations, addressed issues such as rotation time and pitch, iterative reconstruction, uh, noise index, slice thickness. Uh, we uh, revamped our feather light protocols on the light speed. We again uh, broached the topic of how BMI may be affecting our CTD evolved data and is this an opportunity to begin categorizing how we uh, uh, comprise or formulate our protocols as they relate to patient body habitus. After this uh, two-day intensive activity, it was determined that we would need another week focused on staff education just to continue the process and then also to continue the protocol optimization activity. The next slide is extremely busy, but this has been an unbelievable tool for our particular department, and I would strongly advise you to create a spreadsheet like this or similar to this for your own institution. And this is what, this is what I created for the team. This is the pre and post display of the protocols. And the yellow header labeled pre are the protocols that we evaluated and the red uh, factors are those that we decided to change during the protocol optimization activity. And they are then displayed in green under the red header that says post. So in a snapshot, in perpetuity, we now have communicated and documented what we've done for our protocols. And we've done this for all of our protocols. I just used this particular snapshot for this presentation. Under the purple heading, you'll see technologist and radiologist initials. So the technologist, the radiologist, and any other professional involved, in this case it was the application specialist, who participated in modifying a protocol is obligated to sign or initial that column. And then we had to date it. And then there's a section for comments or narrative. And this is very important. For example, all of the neuroradiology protocols that we modify must be reviewed and approved by the section chief of neuroradiology. And this is also true for all our pediatric protocols. Well, that goes there. So Dr. Rabin is our section chief of neuroradiology. Dr. McFadden is our section chief for pediatric radiology, and they helped us review and modify the protocols. The other narrative that you see going down the page are just the two major factors that were changed 
change that we thought were most instrumental in affecting dose. But anything can go there. This would also be a very good place to put your ideas about subsequent follow-up. If you're changing a protocol and just piloting it and then you want to find out later on what it does, that would be a good place to add a tickler. So this is very important, not only for your own internal review, but for external auditing purposes as well. I strongly advise you to keep a running log of how you change your protocols because very few of us can remember even from yesterday, let alone six months ago or two years ago, why and when and who and who was responsible for changing a protocol. So after we had this extremely worthwhile experience with our GE partner, Dr. Suela Sulo for the Russell Institute came up to me and said, you know, Dr. Loren, this is just screaming for a quality improvement project committee. And I couldn't have agreed with her more enthusiastically. And her point being is that it takes a coalition of disciplines and engaged professionals coming together to make an effective dose management team that can also be sustained. And the other thing we decided to do after we reached out to the Russell Institute and also to our GE healthcare partners was to decide that we had to come up with our own internal mission statement or objective. And this keeps us on task. And I also strongly advise you to do this as well if you're thinking about forming more of a standardized or formal committee or coalition to address dose and dose management in your institution. This keeps you on task. It reminds you and the technologists and the nurses and the associates and the community and the patients why we're doing what we're doing. And our particular objective is to improve patient care delivery based on scientific data-driven evidence through radiation dose management, protocol optimization, education, and transformational change throughout the CD department at Advocate Lutheran General Hospital. And I want to emphasize transformational change because it is a culture change that is to occur in your department. This isn't just learning about a new catheter system or a new keyboard on a CT scanner. It's changing the whole approach to how we're keeping our patients safer by reducing dose and managing that dose. So the next slide um, is the dream team or the core team of our QIP. Um, we have uh, great support from the director of imaging, from the manager of operations who also oversees the CT department as well as other departments, our wonderful CT coordinator. There is a medical physicist involved. Dr. Suela uh, is part of the Russell Institute. We were very fortunate this summer to have a research intern from the Rosalind Franklin University Medical School. And of course, we have the uh, experts on the GE team. This slide could contain and should contain many, many other names who form the ancillary bench support, if you will. But this is the core team who meets regularly and sets up the objectives and the deliverables for the Dose Management Quality Improvement Project. The other thing that we committed to doing was define specific aims. So we are dedicated to improving the competency, skill, and knowledge of CT workforce using a standardized assessment tool. We are dedicated to reducing the average delivered dose to CTDI vol and variation in that average delivered dose of the five most common CT protocols to begin with. We are dedicated to regularly monitoring the CT image quality to ensure that diagnostic interpretal value is maintained, that the integrity of the diagnostic image quality is preserved. We are dedicated to submitting our data to the dose index registry to evaluate our performance against national benchmarks. We're dedicated to performing regular internal audit reviews of our data. We're dedicated to tracking repeat CT exams or frequent flyers within a predetermined 90-day period to understand why this is occurring. We're dedicated to creating education platforms for the physicians throughout the hospital and our associates. We're going to be partnering with the public relations and marketing team to increase awareness among our patients and throughout the community because we strongly believe that this is a key differentiator in the marketplace. And it can be a key differentiator for you as well in your marketplace. So please remember that. We are dedicated to determining the effect, including the financial benefit, on retaining our patients and getting new patient referrals once we disseminate the information that we are increasing awareness and that we are aggressively managing dose to be as low as possible without compromising the experience for the patient or diagnostic quality. 
We would like to publish our experience, and of course, finally, we are dedicated to focusing exclusively on a robust pediatric radiation dose reduction strategic platform, although we already have a very comprehensive pediatric radiation dose uh, reduction strategy uh, protocol dossier that we use in the children's hospital. So the data analysis and education uh, component of the QIP is divided into three steps. So step one is to analyze the data before we modify the protocol. And we're referring to that as pre-DAO. And if you remember, that was the first 90-day period that occurred between January of 2014 and March of 2014. And we're going to compare that to the dose watch data after we optimized the protocols and began the education curriculum with the technologist. And that's referred to as the post-DAO. So this dovetailed into the optimization activities that occurred the weeks of April 18th and May 5th. We are targeting those five most common protocols. We are also going to try to understand the role BMI plays in all of this vis-a-vis -vis the outlier data. And we're also going to track those repeat patients, and we've identified them arbitrarily as those patients who receive five CTs or more during a 90-day period. Step two is to execute the comprehensive technologist education plan, and we've dedicated three solid months to this. And it will include all of the technologists, the nine for the AM shift, the six for the PM shift, and the three for the overnight shift. And this really is a very specific and detailed curriculum, and it is the result of great commitment on the part of leadership at Advocate Lutheran General Hospital, the Russell Institute, and GE Healthcare. I have committed to four lectures. This is the first of the four, and the technologists are listening in. GE has committed to one didactic lecture as well. And what the leaders of the QIP team determined was that we would identify those education online modules that are on the GE website as a way to increase the education. There is really a very rich menu of valuable online modules that I encourage you to explore. We will have the technologists participate in both general modules that address general concepts such as ionizing radiation and dose management and the specific modules that target those education gaps or areas of opportunities for improvement or continued improvement. We will continue to support one-on-one -on -one and one-on-small -on group on-campus instruction provided by our GE application specialists. And we created a system-wide symposium, a radiation dose reduction symposium. This will be year three of that symposium, which will occur October 18th, and the technologists will qualify to earn their CEU. And this is very important. And this is another component of your dose management program that I would strongly urge you to create, some sort of formal education platform or opportunity or venue for not only technologists and radiologists to uh, attend, but for uh, referring physicians and other associates and nurses throughout the hospital. So we're very proud of this, and this is going to continue uh, for many years, and it's very well attended and very well supported. Step three is to then gather a third set of data after the three-month intense technologist education module. And we're going to try to determine whether there's uh, efficacy or the impact uh, provided by that education plan. And then we're also going to retest uh, those randomly selected CT technologists to see if there's any change in their comprehension after they've also been included in that intense uh, uh, technologist-focused uh, comprehension plan. And the next is just a graphic of our timeline, which I think really illustrates very nicely what I've been saying with words. Uh, the pre- and post-DAO analysis will be finalized by the end of this month. We are in the process of uh, fine-tuning the education plan this month. That will be executed uh, the months of September, October, and November. We then plan on collecting another 90-day uh, period of data after that education plan. Uh, at the same time, concurrent with that, we will begin to create an education platform for outreach to our referring physicians and our associates. We also will begin um, intense discussions with our public relations and marketing team to understand how we can increase awareness on a more uh, global platform, not only among the patients and throughout the community, but perhaps uh, on a larger scale than that, realizing that this is a very important differentiator. 
We will then address the potential financial impact of our quality improvement project and then begin publishing our results and implementing a format that can be used to sustain the CLIP. It is important to be able to sustain the dose management program that you begin and take so long uh, to create. It's very time and labor intensive, so there should be sustainability for your efforts. So now I'm very happy to share some uh, early results. Uh, again, uh, we, we conducted uh, an activity analysis and we looked at the breakdown of the uh, exams that were performed during the same time period. Uh, for this particular time, we saw that one patient actually received 11 protocols, again, either a trauma patient or possibly a catastrophic uh, neurologic event had occurred with the patient because it began with a CT angio of the head and neck and perfusion study and then a series of brain CT scans as well as a CT angiogram of the circle of Willis. Next slide. Now, this is where the rubber hits the road in terms of seeing in actual objective data representation format the fruits of our labor, if you will. Let me explain what this scatter plot is. The pre-DAO data for all the protocols related to the abdomen and pelvis stone protocol are clustered to the right hand to the left hand side of the scatter plot. So you see that there are values at and below the DRL and many, many values above the DRL. All the data to the right of the slide under the line demarcating DRL is our post-DAO data. This is after we participated in a very robust protocol optimization activity and we began the technologist education piece. This is really stunning results. We have one patient who's an outlier and we will do a deep dive about why that occurred. This is stunning results. And not only are all the data below the DRL, but you can see that they're more tightly clustered as well by the change in the standard deviation from 8.7 for the first half of the year to 7.8 towards the second half of the year. What does this tell us? We think this tells us a couple things, and again, we're still at the anecdotal stages of analyzing this particular piece of the data, but we feel that the education that all of us underwent during those two weeks helped us protocol the exams better, identify opportunities to decrease dose, not only addressing those 11 factors that scientifically affect dose, but perhaps how we retooled some of the protocols real time. Did we really need that extra series? Did we really need the same technique for a delayed series? Could we use low dose CT for a delayed series? We are beginning to follow routine CT scans of the chest for those patients undergoing lobectomy um, uh, and for economy for, for lung cancer with our low-dose CT protocol that we use for our screening program. So all of that plays into this, and really it is a testimonial to the increased awareness and change in culture that is occurring in our department. And that particular drop uh, calculates to be about a 19% drop in the CTDI vol values. This is some early data that we have to share with you about the uh, head CT scans. Now, we did change the ACER from 10 to 20%. We did change the slice thickness, but uh, we also changed the manual MA from 350 to 320. And this translated into about a 9% decrease in the dose. The next slide is the color-coded bar graph showing the pre and post DAO data for our CT of the chest for pulmonary embolism. We did change the ACER from 30 to 40 percent, but more importantly, which is not written on the slide here, is that we went from a 1.3 slice thickness to a 2.5 slice thickness, a 1.25 interval to a 2.5 interval, and then, of course, we changed the ACER and a, and a SCOSH change in the noise index. So it was a compilation of all those factors that we changed, and this has translated uh, at first blush to about a 7% uh, decrease in the dose. 
our efforts have been recognized by the American College of Radiology, and I would invite you to go on their ACR Imaging 3.0 website in the future to read about our experience and the journey uh, that we're on uh, for dose management. We're very proud of it. It has taken the village. It's taken the commitment and dedication of really impassioned professionals in the CT department uh, from GE and at the Russell Institute for Research and Innovation. Uh, for those of you who are still accredited uh, by the Joint Commission, I just thought it would be good to have a slide that reminds you of uh, what those standards are. All healthcare entities performing CT must be registered with the AART or the NMTCD by July 15th, 2015. You should have established or have in place a comprehensive interdepartmental radiation safety program, which should include an active, ongoing, significant, significant education training curriculum in accordance with the recommendations put forward by the Image Gently and Image Wisely campaigns. Um, the CTDI and DLP for the, DLP for the patients uh, have to be in the final report, and they need to be included uh, as dose information in the patient's medical record and a medical physicist must annually benchmark and review both adult and pediatric imaging protocols. I encourage you to read the article written by Neil Singh, which is on the Ant Mini website. It's referenced at the bottom of the slide. Uh, he does a very nice job of explaining this to you in further detail, uh, should that be of interest to you. At this time, I, I just want to talk a little bit about my final thoughts and summary about what all this means and what this could mean for you. It really isn't just about the software. It's the coming together of people, process, and technology. With people, we're talking about physicists, technologists, radiologists, risk management. When we talk about processes, we're talking about how to calculate dose, managing your protocols, risk management is a process that needs to be addressed, your informed decision support, the education component for both the radiologists and the staff, you're referring physicians and associates as well as the patients and the community, the technology, ensuring that your equipment is updated and that you're using low-dose technology, that there's order entry management decision support, that there's an automated dose management solution algorithm in place. And I find when I speak to many of my colleagues that the hardest part in all of this is getting started. And what we found to be very helpful is to realize that it can be a challenge, but we embrace the challenge. Because by embracing the challenge, we create opportunities for growth and improvement. So you must realize that the challenge encompasses assessing dose and the protocols, and managing those protocols, and optimizing them. It means always focusing on improved outcomes from the data. It means that this is a journey of transformational and cultural change in your department, and that each and every one of us is an ambassador for that change for the better, keeping our patients safer, and that it all revolves around education and increased awareness, which must be ongoing and sustainable. And any project wouldn't be complete if there wasn't focused attention on advanced workflows. They must be addressed. Your clinical decision support, the periodic revision of your policies and procedures, whether it's allergic reaction reporting, whether it's extravasation reporting, whether it's your pregnancy protocol. Incident risk management planning is very important. And then build the team. No one person needs to do all the heavy lifting. When you put together a coalition of dedicated professionals, you'd be surprised how the work can be divided up efficiently and productively. It is absolutely integral to identify a physician champion or two or three. And I want to take a pause here and talk about how to engage radiologists. Again, it's to identify the person who has the passion, the fire in his or her belly, who gets it, who wants to make a change, and is willing to put forward the effort and the time that this will entail. That same individual should be one who's able to establish a sense of urgency 
and there is urgency to this. We need to do this now, not only because it's the right thing to do, but because the guidelines and the mandates and the regulatory requirements are fast and furious, and this is going to be expected of us and of our patients. And this is also a golden opportunity from the perspective of the radiologist to reclaim that role of being the clinical consultant, the expert, to help the referring physicians. And this is how we add value. We add value as a radiologist in our role to re-engage and reconnect with hospital and facility leadership as well as with our referring physicians. No one is going to know this better than you do. Take advantage of that wealth of knowledge that you're going to be learning and acquiring and use it to help your referring physicians. They're going to need our help, and we're here to partner with them. So this is a wonderful opportunity to realize that this is how we can reclaim what we do best as radiologists and what we've been trained to do. We're out there to educate, to lead, and to train. A lead CT technologist or coordinator is an invaluable partner. We have an excellent one in our department. Our team of CT technologists and our managers are outstanding. The medical physicist, of course, is going to be at the head of the Chevron. He's the one that drives this. He's the one that answers all of our questions. He's the one that takes the complicated scientific lexicon and nomenclature and makes it easy to digest, to learn, and then to recapitulate and, and, to, and to spread the word to others. And again, I'd like to stress the importance of partnering with your vendor. Really exploit the customer relationship marketing concept. Make them an extension of your department. It's a win-win for everyone. They will feel comfortable coming your, your, into your department. Your team will feel comfortable having them on campus. There will be a very fluid and dynamic relationship among all the members of the team. And this is how you can sustain the momentum of what you're going to start or what you've already started. And I get that question as well. How do we sustain and continue to contribute to the educational growth, let's say? Well, first and foremost, put together a formal quip or some sort of coalition. Make sure that the people who are involved in the quip are those who are in a position to educate others. And a CT coordinator, for example, is the perfect person for that, as is your physician champion, as is the manager. These are perfect individuals who interact on an hourly basis with their colleagues, with house staff, with referring physicians, with patients. Okay? I'd also like to take this opportunity to <clears throat> remind you <clears throat> that it's very important how we telegraph the message and answer the questions that could be coming our way from both our patients and referring physicians. Make sure that you standardize a script, if you will, in how the questions will begin to get answered about what does CTDIVOL mean? What does DLP mean? What does it mean if my patient reaches a cumulative dose level and now I need to order another CT scan. Come together as a team and reach a consensus on how that message should be relayed. Most importantly as well is to integrate and engage both your internal and external stakeholders. Make your message clear. Make it simple. Make it clear. Have a compelling argument why this is the right thing to do, and why you're doing such an amazing job for your patients. That's the message that they want to hear. And that's a very easy message to market. And you're going to market it to C-suite executives, to hospital administration, to referring physicians, to residents, medical students, patients, and the community. And how do you do that? You take every opportunity that is offered to you to get in front of those stakeholders whether it's at the cabinet level, the governance council level, the executive management team, whether it's the Rotary Club. We have a council of advisors here where people from the community are brought in to provide feedback about what they feel is important. If it's grand rounds, if it's morbidity and mortality, if it's just an invitation to sit in on a staff meeting, whatever it is, get in front of it. Have your message be clear and compelling and begin to market it, both informally over a cup of coffee in the doctor's or surgeon's lounge or with videos, formal uh, presentations. We have a weekly community lecture series with pamphlets and brochures or whatever you feel is most relevant for the community of patients you are privileged to serve. 
And on that note, I just want to end with my mantra, and that is, this absolutely is the right thing to do. And I hope after this webinar that you feel that it's the right thing to do and that I've inspired you to take hold of this wonderful opportunity, this challenge that's been placed in our lap, and make the best of it because I know you can. And again, thank you so much for your time and attention, and I look forward to hearing back from, from many of you if you'd like to share your experiences with me. Have a great day. Thank you very much, Dr. Arndt. I wanted to thank everyone on the phone for um, attending this, this webinar, and both, both uh, thanking Dr. Arndt and the whole advocate team. I mean, as she talked about, just the whole focus on culture change, using data to actually drive where you want to be, and really focusing on having goals and building those teams. So those are three of the big things I took away from this session, and again, just always focusing on patient outcomes. So thank you again to you and to the whole advocate team for all the great work you've been doing. Um, on your screen here, you'll, you'll see a quick survey that we've put together. If you are able to fill that out, we would greatly appreciate it. And, uh, and so we, uh, we thank you for your time on the call. And I know there was a few questions around um, just will this information be available after the session, and yes, we will be sending out a link to the information um, for you to be able to access it after the call. So thanks again, and have a great day. Christine, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, and thank you for attending. That concludes our webcast. Have a wonderful day.